Go. Good evening and a warm welcome to yet another biography event. I hope everyone is staying safe and wearing masks and reading many biographies. My name is Kai Bird and I'm the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center of the City, uh, City University of New York, CUNY, and founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in 2007. I want to thank Shelby for her steadfast support for the Biography Center. It is her vision that makes this program possible. Please note that our next event is on October 21st, featuring Heather Clark in conversation with Ruth Franklin. Heather will be speaking about her groundbreaking, massive new biography of Sylvia Plath. But tonight, we are here to celebrate Larry Tai and his own groundbreaking and ever so timely biography of Joseph McCarthy, Demagogue, the Life and Long Shadow of Senator Joe McCarthy. Larry Tai is a journalist by background, but he has become a hardworking biographer. His first book, The Father of Spin, was a biography of public relations pioneer Edward L. Bernays. He has also published a biography of Satchel Paige, and his last biography was Bobby Kennedy, The Making of a Liberal Icon. Victor Navasky also is joining us in conversation to interrogate Larry Ty. Victor chairs the Columbia Journalism Review. He was the George Delacorte Professor of Magazine Journalism at the Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. He has served as editor, publisher, and now publisher emeritus of The Nation, which he joined in 1978. His books include Kennedy Justice, Naming Names, which won a National Book Award, and A Matter of Opinion, which won the 2005 George Polk Book Award and the 2006 Ann Sperber Prize. Uh, Navasky is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Most recently, he has published The Art of Making Magazines on being an editor and other views for the industry. And last but not least, The Art of Controversy, political cartoons and their enduring power. The three of us are gonna have a conversation for about 40 minutes and then take questions from our virtual audience. Please click on the question box below at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions. And we will be sure to get to many as we can. We will try to end this program after about one hour. Again, thanks to the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our other events. And Larry Ty, congratulations on this formidable accomplishment. Now I'm gonna ask the first question to get things going. Larry, this is a very tough book. Demagogue is in the title, a tough title. But the book is kind of remarkable in my view in that this is the first biography of McCarthy that for me at least really sort of humanizes him. You see his struggles and particularly his insecurities, his vast insecurities. So I'd like to begin by having you talk a little bit about Joe McCarthy as the man. And you know, you say he was, quote, more insecure than we imagined. And of course, the parallels to our current president are vivid. Sure. So I want to say that the words that were ringing in my ear when I started writing this book were what Ethel Kennedy told me about Joe McCarthy when I was writing a biography of her husband, Bobby. And she said something that um, struck me as unusual, if not odd. She said that Joe McCarthy might be a monster to much of America, but to Bobby and <laughs> Ethel, he was just plain good fun. And the notion of anybody, and particularly somebody, an iconic figure like Ethel Kennedy, calling Joe McCarthy good fun, struck me as unusual and as a side of him that I wanted to understand at least why Ethel and Bobby thought that he was. And so one of the things that you do when you're writing a biography and when you're writing the 101st biography on a character like Joe McCarthy, the world would 
be right in asking why we needed another biography. And I was lucky enough when I was writing this book to have the first and exclusive access to all of McCarthy's personal and professional papers, which began to give me a little insight into that other side of Joe McCarthy. They included everything from his love letters to his wannabe and eventual wife, to his real-time diaries from the South Pacific Island that he served on during World War II, to all of these papers that had enormous red stamps in the upper right-hand corner that said top secret. And they were papers leaked to him by the FBI, the CIA, and others. And I think what all of those papers, along with his medical records, along with 9,000 pages of newly unveiled transcripts of his closed door hearings, what they did was gave a sense that in part, Joe McCarthy was even more evil than we had thought, but he also was in a strange way more charming. He was the kind of guy that charmed the heck out of all the Kennedy family, from Jack to the two Kennedy sisters that he dated, Eunice and Patricia, to Bobby, who he charmed enough that when Jack told Bobby to stay away from Joe McCarthy's funeral, Bobby went anyway out of a sense of loyalty to him. And the character that emerged was a guy who I would, and I think even the two of you would have loved to have gone out for a beer with. He was the kind of guy... <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> he was this strange guy that during the day he could grill and totally destroy the people that he called before his subcommittee. And at night, he would invite them to go out for a drink with him because to Joe McCarthy, it was all some kind of a game. And he assumed that his targets understood the rules. And he assumed that like the boxer that he was, you could shake hands at the end of the bout and come out and be friends. And that was partly Joe McCarthy's charm and it was partly his incredible blindsidedness that he didn't understand, I'm convinced, the effect he was having on his victims. Part of it uh, is, and by the way, congratulations on your very special book. But it seems to me part of it was that he didn't half the time know who his victims were. He became famous by saying, I have here in my hand the names of 205 members of the Communist Party working in the State Department, and he didn't have those in his hands, and, and he didn't know who they were. Whenever anyone asked him, he said, well, I left them in the car, I did this and I did that. So that was part of the reason. I'm not sure I would like to have been drinking beer with him. <laughs> uh, Kai mentioned what, or you mentioned what you said about Ethel saying he was fun. And I, that was going to be my first question to you. Did she give you any examples of the way in which it was fun? Yes. So the example that she used was uh, Bobby and Ethel had one child in those days, and it was Kathleen, um, their daughter. And she was a toddler. And Joe McCarthy was wonderful with kids. And Kathleen fell in love with Joe. Joe apparently fell in love with Kathleen. And the relationship was so close that Ethel said that they had actually named Joe McCarthy Kathleen's godfather. Now, Kathleen was very quick when I told her what her mother had said to show me the papers and show me who her real godfather was, and it sure as heck wasn't Joe McCarthy, but that was how close that they were. It was that he was to them um, this grandfatherly type figure who played with their child and children, who gave Bobby his first job when Bobby really wasn't qualified for much of any job, having finished in the smack in the middle of his law school class, and who embraced the whole family in a way that they thought, that Ethel thought, was charming. And it was, to me, um, this was the Bobby Kennedy that you, Victor, helped me understand through your great book on his time at the Justice Department and through the wonderful interview you gave me when I was writing about Bobby. It was Bobby Kennedy who was, on the one hand, the good Bobby who became this um, wonderful leader in everything from civil rights to civil liberties to all kinds of other issues. 
And it was also the Bobby Kennedy who started as a cold warrior and had a blind spot about a lot of things in his life, including about Joe McCarthy. So I think that statement said as much about Bobby and Ethel as it did about Joe McCarthy being a great guy. Okay. So Larry, uh, coming back to something you, you said just a minute or ago, um, I'm sort of astonished that after so many decades, you come along and you're the first historian who gets access to all these papers at Marquette. How did that happen? How could these papers have been hidden away all these years? So you both know me a little bit enough to know that it wasn't because I'm charming. Um, <laughs> I think that it was partly because I was persistent. I asked and I would ask again it was partly because I had in my corner asking on my behalf um, a woman named Greta Van Susteren, a TV journalist, and her father was Joe McCarthy's closest friend, and she had contacts with the family that she asked on my behalf. Um, it may have been because exactly a week after I had told my wife and my publisher that I had no prayer, that I had asked enough times and I had no prayer of getting the papers, I sent a critical member of the family a six pack of Grater's ice cream from Cincinnati with a note saying, I don't wanna leave you with a sour taste. I've been a pain in the neck for all this time and I promise forever to go away, but I wanna leave you with a sweet taste. Uh, oh, you uh, are charming. So it may have been, it may have been Greta, it may have been Persistence, it could well have been the best ice cream in America, Grater's ice cream, but I also think that it was the family not understanding exactly what was in the papers, but I think that if you went through life being Joe McCarthy's daughter or another close relative, it may have been them wanting to me, me to finally expose what was in these papers and a little bit of payback for having spent 60 years having to live with that stigma of being so closely connected to Joe McCarthy. The strange thing was the only people more surprised with me that I got access were the archivists at Marquette. And I think that they thought they were gonna go to their grave with them being the only ones who had ever had a look at these papers. So as delighted as I was, they were even more delighted when they emailed me to say that this approval had come through. And it was a strange kind of approval because it said, we will unlock the papers for you, but the day you stop looking, they go back under lock and key. Whoa, really? So they're back, they're closed again. So they are closed again, and either I got the story right or nobody will ever know the difference because, at least for now, they're back under lock and key. So they're still under the control, under the deed of the family, not the university. They are, and the deed of the family said the papers would become public under one of two conditions, either when Joe McCarthy's daughter said they would become public or when she died. And she is younger and healthier than any of the three of us, and so it will hopefully be a long time before that condition would have kick in. Well, she's the adopted daughter. She is the adopted daughter. She was an infant when Joe died. She was the best thing to happen in his life, but she came along too late to turn it around and to have him give up his addiction that ended up killing him. Right. You know, uh, it doesn't surprise me that they granted you the opportunity to read these papers because uh, until I read your book, McCarthy to me was a close second to the most evil person in my lifetime in American politics. J. Edgar Hoover was the first and McCarthy was the second. But you point out and you, you, give, you give the um, evidence that he was a war hero in World War II and he volunteered, he put himself in harm's way and he did some things that have nothing to do with the image that we had of McCarthy before we read your book. So I'm interested in how you reconcile what he did that makes him worthy of being called a war hero with what he did with the rest of his life. Sure, so can I start up by just saying a couple words on the war hero part. Joe McCarthy, 
in his first successful campaign for Senate in 1946, um, gave himself the moniker Tail Gunner Joe. And in fact, a lot of journalists got lots of evidence from the Marine Corps that Joe McCarthy's official duty in the South Pacific Island during the war was as a land-based intelligence officer. And they said, you're lying about that. And Tail Gunner Joe went from being his chosen moniker to being a caricature of him. NBC did an entire documentary, an hour-long film on him called Tail Gunner Joe, where that was a caricature. And that was what went down as the official story, that it was one more way that Joe McCarthy was lying. Well, in those files at Marquette University were his real-time handwritten diaries from the war and were letters from all of his squad mates to him. And what they showed is while he was officially a land-based intelligence officer, he volunteered to go up in the skies. He came under enemy fire. He was often back there as a tail gunner and he got a dozen medals and these files made clear that he deserved those medals. So to me, the lesson was, if you lie often enough the way Joe McCarthy did, on the rare occasions when you were telling the truth, nobody's going to believe you. But I think it also made him into a more interesting and more flesh and blood kind of character. That there were times in the new files that I saw that I could show that he was telling the truth and that he was better than history's caricature of him made him out to be. But for every one of those times, there were 10 times that he was more evil and more abusive of his witnesses. When you looked at those transcripts of all the things that went on behind closed doors, it made clear that when he tossed out the public and tossed out the press from the two thirds of his hearings where he locked the doors, that it was Joe McCarthy unhinged. Any pretense of witnesses having any rights went out the window. You didn't want to come before Joe McCarthy at any time during the day, but in the morning, he was at least a sober-minded griller and inquisitor. In the afternoon, after his trademark lunch of a hamburger, a raw onion, and plenty of whiskey, his fuse got this much shorter and you didn't want to tangle with Joe McCarthy in the afternoon because he would tear you apart. And those transcripts and all the other records made clear that any pretense of Joe McCarthy knowing what he was doing when he was charging everybody with being a communist was just not true. It was said about him that he could have been dropped into the middle of Red Square on May Day and not recognized a real communist. And I think that was not far from the truth. But how do you reconcile these different McCarthy's? Was it just the whiskey? And which was the real Joe McCarthy? So great question. I reconcile in part if I were putting on my totally um, ill-equipped psychologist hat by saying that I think that in today's era, from what I saw of all the medical files on him at the Bethesda Naval Hospital, I think he was what they would have called in those days manic depressive or what we would today call bipolar. And I think there were two ends of Joe McCarthy in terms of his psychiatric makeup. But I also think that if I had to pick one that was the real Joe McCarthy, the real Joe McCarthy was the evil red baiting um, rights abusing U.S. Senator that we saw in the Army McCarthy hearings and throughout his career. And the other side was this, in a way, clueless side, but charming side of Joe McCarthy, who's the kind of guy that I'm convinced, um, Victor, that you would have, at least grudgingly, being the great journalist you are, would have gone, would have wanted to join us for a beer that night um, if we if we could have done that with him. Okay, so can I just say one more quick thing there? Sure. You both will remember Bobby Kennedy, one of the most famous um, pieces ever written on Bobby Kennedy was actually a cartoon on him. And it was a cartoon that talked about the good Bobby and the bad Bobby, the two sides of Bobby Kennedy. And I'm convinced that 
the good Bobby in the end overwhelmed the bad Bobby. I'm convinced there was a good Joe and a bad Joe, and we could have done a cartoon about him as well, only in his case, the bad Joe would have overwhelmed the good Joe. And certainly in the case of all of his victims, they would have felt that way. Well, that's an interesting analogy. Wow. So keeping on the personal, and not to be salacious, but to talk a little bit about sex. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the sentences that sort of struck me in your book was you, you wrote about his wife, Jean. He, Joe, did love Jean, but he wouldn't have married her if she hadn't been so persistent and if he hadn't been so, un, so unwell and so alone. Can you expand on that a little bit? What, what was going on with that relationship? So in reading the letters that he sent her and her replies or telegrams back and forth that were in his files, it was clear that the initiative for that relationship, once it really got going, came from her. And there was also a strong sense um, in everything from his FBI files to his personal files that Joe McCarthy was aware, especially in the Roy Cohn and David Shine days, that there were rumors not just that Roy Cohn and David Shine were gay, but that Joe McCarthy might have been gay as well. He was this bachelor senator who shows up in Washington. And I think that marrying Jean was partly that he truly was by the end in love with her. But I also think that it was the kind of cover that um, he needed. He showed in his life that he would grab fig leaves to give him cover from various attacks that were being leveled against him. So when he was attacked, rightfully, I think, as being an anti-Semite, he goes out and hires a brilliant, arrogant Jewish lawyer named Roy Cohn, and he tells all of his friends who asked, I hired Roy Cohn to give me protection when the Anti-Defamation League and other groups were coming after him. He was, um, I think, knowing that he was, that there were these whispers and sometimes more than a whisper by people like Drew Pearson, the famous columnist back then, um, whispers that Joe McCarthy was gay. I think getting married was a way of dispelling those rumors. I think that um, I believe lots of stories about him. Um, one was that he might've been, um, a little abusive of young women, more than a little bit rough. I think that he might have toyed around. There were all kinds of rumors that the FBI was exploring that he might have been gay and he might have been, but I also think by the end, the same way by the end, he might have been one of the few people in America who still believe the things he was saying about communists. I think by the end, he was truly in love with Jean and they ended up having a great marriage. Wanted to prove that he was not gay. Why would he hire Roy Cohn, who was gay? The person who so that's that. that's so, a great question. The rumors about him being gay were largely after he had hired Roy Cohn. So it was sort of in those days that various people, including his colleagues in the Senate, were suggesting it wasn't just um, this duo of Cohn and Shine but that it was a trio, a famous senator from Vermont who was the one who leveled the earliest charges against McCarthy, a guy named Ralph Sand, uh, Flanders, said that he thought it was, that Joe McCarthy was part of this um, trio of Cone, Shine, McCarthy. Well, what, what, speaking of Cone, what do you, who influenced who more, Cone or McCarthy? Who influenced the other? And the cone that ended up with Donald Trump, did that come from his working with McCarthy or that was all Roy Cohn and himself anyway? So answering the first question, um, I think Roy Cohn reinforced every bad instinct in Joe McCarthy, but Joe McCarthy was the boss and he's the one who ultimately is to blame. A lot of people, including Bobby Kennedy, tried to blame Roy Cohn for all of Joe McCarthy's excesses, and I think that's unfair. I do think by the time the Roy Cohn had finished his um, being Joe McCarthy's protege and had fine-tuned all of his skills, and 30 years later was hired by Fred Trump and Donald Trump 
to tutor a young Donald Trump as he was entering this cutthroat world of New York real estate, I think that Roy Cohn had internalized every one of the lessons of McCarthy and McCarthyism, and he taught them to Donald Trump. And I think the only one who learned more from Joe McCarthy than Roy Cohn was Donald Trump. And every time over the last four years when Donald Trump has gotten into trouble, he has ha said, I wish I had Roy Cohn looking out for me. Well, I think what he's really saying, only it would be un-PC to say it is, I wish I had Joe McCarthy looking out for me because it was his mentor's mentor that really taught him the lessons. Roy Cohn was just an intermediary. So Larry, keeping on this subject of Roy Cohn, you call him a master homophobe, but you give surprisingly to me ambiguous evidence about his own sexuality. He dated Barbara Walters. He had a crush on David Shine, maybe. But then you quote Murray Kempton saying, well, he didn't think he was queer, quote. Um, and yet we all know how he died of AIDS. And uh, so what was going on in your, what did you conclude about Roy Cohen and his sexuality? So I concluded that like many gay men of that era, that Roy Cohn had a really difficult time um, admitting to himself and certainly wouldn't admit to anybody else um, that he was gay back then. And I think the idea of dating Barbara Walters uh, was a fig leaf. And I think that the, or was maybe trying to convince himself that he really was heterosexual or bisexual, but over the years, um, as being gay became more acceptable, Roy Cohn became more openly gay, but never enough, even by the end when he was dying of AIDS, to admit that he was gay. It took his lovers coming out at the end and after the fact saying, what's the question? There's no question here. Um, I think that David Shine was also probably going through a, a process of self-exploration and trying to understand his own sexuality back then. Over the years, he perpetually denied having had any kind of a gay relationship with Roy Cohn, and he ended up marrying, I think it was Miss Universe, which I think maybe <laughs> was trying to, him making some strong statement about just how macho he was. But I think that, the, that um, in those days, as Joe McCarthy gave prima facie evidence for being gay, was as bad as being read. And the idea that Roy Cohn was staffing Joe McCarthy in his hearings, his gay bashing hearings, was one more extraordinary instance of their hypocrisy. Wow. So uh, another question, unless Victor, you had something you wanted to jump in? I wanted to jump in, but but, I'm interested in your question. Well, I was going to move it to off sexual issues. <laughs> we, <laughs> we handled that very well. But um, I'm interested in, in Dwight Eisenhower. And I've always been curious when reading about McCarthyism and the odyssey of Joe McCarthy, uh, why didn't Dwight Eisenhower shut him down? And you, you no write brother wanted him to do it. Yeah. Uh, you, you, Larry, you call him an enabler, yes. the president. Ac actually, I call him the enabler in chief. And I think the that he was. Chief, right? And I think that Eisenhower's first stumble on McCarthy was during the campaign um, when he was running in 52 for the Republican nomination. He is in Wisconsin. McCarthy has just attacked Eisenhower's great World War II comrade and friend, General George C. Marshall, and he has attacked him in classic McCarthy fashion, going so overboard, and a conspiracy, um, the, the worst communist conspiracy in our history, infamy so black, all of these words that were just totally over the top and clearly beyond Joe McCarthy's vocabulary as well as any understanding of who Marshall was. Eisenhower had a speech in his hand that he was going to deliver attacking McCarthy. His aide said, no, we might need Wisconsin to secure the nomination, which of course he didn't need. 
he, I think one of the few regrets Eisenhower ever had in his public life was not delivering that speech. But then he had shown a profile in inaction and certainly the opposite of a profile in courage during the campaign. But when he finally got into the White House and he could do what he wanted to do, from moment number one of his presidency, his brothers Milton and Arthur were whispering in Dwight's ear, saying, take on the bully, give up a little of your enormous popularity. And Eisenhower's response was, no, we've got to let McCarthy do himself in, which might have been strategically an interesting approach if lives weren't being ruined in the interim. And in the year and a half that it took Eisenhower to finally stand up to McCarthy, nearly a dozen people had committed suicide, including two US senators, careers and lives had been ruined, and a whole part of our public discourse had been shut off because of Joe McCarthy. And I think that lasted for a generation, or you could say it's lasted to today, still the most scandalous thing you could say about somebody in a race for president is calling them a socialist or a communist. And Joe McCarthy didn't start that, but he certainly encouraged that kind of narrow-minded thinking. Well, you give a great picture of what, how everybody thought as a result in part of him or, or because of him. One of the little facts that you cover in it is my own magazine, The Nation, long before I got there, uh, you, you point out as Marie Yehoda from NYU, the psychologist, said in, in, in those times, if you read a magazine like The Nation, you shouldn't bring it to your office. You should hide the fact that you read it or have a good excuse for bringing it to the office. And you give McCarthy half credit for that, but also in your discussion of the journalists who you say magnified his importance and made it impossible to see him. I'm curious what you think the rest of their role was and which journalists played the major role in bringing him down. You refer to Murray Kempton, who I read religiously uh, as someone who attacked him all the time, but he only plays a small part in your narrative, and who else do you think in the journalistic world? Was it Drew Pearson? Was it X or Y? Sure. So I want to start by saying that journalists played an enormous role in lifting up McCarthy in the first place. When Joe McCarthy gave his famous 205 Communists in the State Department speech, it was not accidental that he picked a place like Wheeling as his staff called it, Wheeling West by God, Virginia, to give that first speech. And he knew that the journalists who would be there covering him in Wheeling, West Virginia, were the reporter from the Wheeling Intelligencer, the local AP reporter, and the guy from the local radio station. He knew that they would have no clue who to call at the State Department to get the other side of that story. And he knew if he gave his speech as a dinner speech, that they would have no time, even if they knew who to call. So within two days, he was on page one of every newspaper in America. And Joe McCarthy understood that what the average newspaper reporter wanted more than anything was to be on page one. And he put them on page one more than anybody but the president, and arguably more than most of the president's who he served under. But in terms of who the reporters were who took him on, it was at places like The Nation that people had the courage to stand up and at magazines like The Reporter Magazine. It was Herb Locke, the cartoonist for The Washington Post, who wrote scathing cartoons on Joe McCarthy. It was more than any single journalist in the early days it was the most widely read columnist in America at that time and the most widely listened to radio broadcaster, Drew Pearson, who wrote 60 scathing columns starting just a month after that first speech in Wheeling. And who it was not was the reporter that our popular histories tell us it was. It was not Edward R. Murrow. A wonderful movie called Good Night and Good Luck made Murrow the dragon slaying, McCarthy slaying hero. And Edward R. Murrow was the first one himself to admit that he was late to the game. He did wonderful broadcasts on his 
hear it now. Hear it now or see it now. See it now, maybe. See it now. Um, see it now. He did wonderful broadcasts, but they weren't until late 1953, after McCarthy had been rampaging for more than three and a half years. So it was, it was also a couple reporters for the Washington Post, including Murray Martyr. Um, it was reporters generally we've forgotten about who were the real heroes in taking him on, and they took him on at their own peril. Drew Pearson ran into Joe McCarthy one night at a famous Washington club called the Soul Grave Club, and McCarthy whacked him a couple times, and had it not been for a great Quaker peacemaker named Richard Nixon, who stepped between the two of them, he probably would have pummel pummeled him. But a couple days later, in the U.S. Senate, Pearson did pummel him. He encouraged all of McCarthy encouraged all of Pearson's sponsors to withdraw their sponsorship of Pearson's radio show. And the biggest sponsor that Pearson had ever had, a company called Adam Hats, withdrew their sponsorship. McCarthy knew how to go after a reporter where it hurt, which was in their pocketbook, and he did it very effectively. And Pearson was even more of a hero in my mind for withstanding that kind of backlash. But you, in, in your book, how, what I don't understand is how much you, in your book you make clear that McCarthy was responsible for everything he did, all these terrible things. But also you point out that he had another speech in his back pocket the night that he gave his 205 communists in the State Department. The other speech dealt with housing and wouldn't have caused any rumble. And it's never explained why he gave the, the second speech rather than the first. Was this all a plan or why did he need a second speech? So I think the fact that he brought two speeches that night to Wheeling was a sign of what an opportunist he was. He was looking for any issue that would keep him from being the one-term senator that he looked destined to be that night of February 9th, 1950, that he was in Wheeling, West Virginia. He had done nothing. He had tried every issue he could think of, including crazily defending the perpetrators of the biggest, the worst massacre of American soldiers during World War II, the so-called Malmedy Massacre. There was only one person in the US government who thought that the Nazi perpetrators were innocent, and that was Joe McCarthy. He reached everywhere he could for an issue. And the fact that he went there that night in Wheeling, if, if, the, if he had given the speech on housing that night and that hadn't caught on, and it was a snoozer of a speech, and it would never have caught on, I'm convinced he would have tried the communist speech the next time he was invited anywhere to give a speech. He was grabbing for anything he could. And when he found an issue that reporters responded to the way they did that night in Wheeling, he never looked back. But it could have been, in his mind, any issue. It didn't have to be a real issue. It was anybody he could scapegoat or anybody he could ballyhoo. And that was a sign that this was a guy, and if this sounds familiar, it should sound familiar, this was a guy who would do whatever it took to grab power and to hold on to that power. He had no grand vision for what he wanted to do once in office. He just wanted to be somebody that people paid attention to. So, Larry, I want to come back again to Ike, Dwight Eisenhower, who I think comes off really badly in your book for good reason. And I, I know this is a bugaboo of mine, but in my first biography, uh, you know, I wrote a biography of John J. McCloy, an obs now obscure former assistant secretary of war during World War II and many other posts. But he was a, McCloy was a close friend of Eisenhower's. And I learned in my McCloy biography that McCarthy was going, beginning to go after McCloy because he had learned that when McCloy was in the War Department, he had approved a policy to issue uh, army commissions to former CP party members who had most often been veterans of the Lincoln Brigade. And of course, General Eisenhower also approved these officer commissions. 
And so when McCarthy was beginning to go after McCloy, I think Eisenhower realized the game was up. He had to begin to protect himself because the next step with this unguided missile named Joe McCarthy was that the, the senator could begin to go after the president himself. Now, do you think I'm overreaching here? Um, so I think you're, it is very difficult with Joe McCarthy to ever overreach. And I think that when we see in the papers at Marquette that he had a file on everybody and a file of dirt on everybody, including on Dwight Eisenhower, it was not overreaching. Whoa. I think that Eisenhower understood that he was vulnerable in terms of the kinds of things that McCarthy was famous for making um, hay out of in terms of things that he had done during World War II. I think he understood that he was vulnerable in terms of his longtime affair with Kay Summersby. And McCarthy had at one point threatened to use that against Eisenhower. Eisenhower understood that unless he took down Joe McCarthy, he was going to be somebody that um, McCarthy was going to go after. Go after in two ways. Go after with charges like those and go after perhaps in contesting the nomination for 1956. And I think that that's one of many reasons that Eisenhower ultimately went after McCarthy. I think the biggest reason was that the only thing that Eisenhower ultimately held totally sacrosanct was the US military. And when McCarthy started attacking the army, that was in Eisenhower's mind, an enemy too big to bully. And finally, Eisenhower developed backbone. He also understood that the American people would countenance a lot of things. It was one thing to go after the State Department or the Voice of America that didn't have a whole lot of backers. It was another thing to go after the armed services. And that was, as Eisenhower perceived, a time to take a stand against McCarthy. But I think a lot of historians have written about what they called the hidden hand theory of how Eisenhower governed. And it was that he did it quietly behind the scenes, that he might have looked like a doddering grandfather who knew only how to play a game of golf, not how to run a country, but that he was quietly behind the scenes doing a brilliant job of steering the country. I think that theory applies in lots of cases, but in Joe McCarthy's case, it was not a hidden hand, it was an empty glove, and Eisenhower deserves to be called on the carpet for that today. I mean, he was very slow to move. And, and too slow to move. Too slow to move, and only f sort of went backed into the corner and and realizing that he, the army was the next victim of the, these this witch hunt. Only then did he move. That's true. And Eisenhower's best friend was his brother Milton, and not listening to his brother's wise counsel was a big mistake. And I think that. He was telling Eisenhower, Ike was telling Milton and others that McCarthy was the ultimate bully. And then he'd go in front of a TV camera and say something nice about him. And it was just the, it didn't wash. You, you um, make that very clear. And you also, at the very beginning of your book, and you come back to it a little bit later, talk about the way in which McCarthy is, was Trump in part. And very curious what you learned from your study of what brought McCarthy down, if it's possible to learn from that, how to bring Trump down. Sure. <laughs> so can I start out actually, um, the one thing I want to read in our uh, time together tonight is two quotes. And I want to read a quote that may have been the most famous quote from Donald Trump in the 2016 election. And people who were tuning in tonight may remember that in, in that campaign in 2016, he boasted to his supporters, and I quote, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, end quote. Exactly 62 years before, the famous pollster George Gallup penned something that I find chillingly similar about Joe McCarthy and his supporters. And I quote, even if it were known that McCarthy had killed five innocent children, they would probably still go along with him, end quote. I think that the similarities are so obvious 
in everything these two guys did that I don't have to waste our time tonight sort of drawing the parallels, but the parallel that matters, and my book, while it was on the most vile character in American history, Joe McCarthy, is ultimately, as I see it, a good news story. And the good news is that every demagogue in American history, from Huey Long and Father Charles Coughlin to George Wallace and David Duke, given the rope, Every one of those demagogues has hung themselves and given the time Americans who made a mistake in buying into them eventually saw, rediscovered their better nature. And I think what we have to do with Donald Trump is do what Donald Trump is doing for himself in this campaign, which is just showing, to quote a famous lawyer, maybe the most famous words ever uttered by an American lawyer in our history, they were uttered by a guy named Joe Welch in the middle of the Army McCarthy hearings, where he said, Senator, have you no sense of decency at long last? Have you no decency? And I kept waiting during that first debate for the moderator, for Wallace to say to Donald Trump, have you no sense of decency? But I think it wasn't what Joe Welch said that mattered. It was that most of America watching Joe McCarthy night after night, had concluded that he had no sense of decency. And I would suggest that anybody who watched that debate or who has watched our president in the last several months, if not last three and a half years, would be aching to ask the same question. And they will, I think, deliver the same verdict that the Senate ultimately delivered on Joe McCarthy when it censured him for behavior that went beyond the pale. Okay, so listen, on that note, we're going to go to questions now. This is the book, fabulous book. And uh, we have a, a number of questions from our virtual audience. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> let's see, this is from uh, Marty Sherwin. I know that guy, <laughs> my co-author on my Oppenheimer biography. Uh, Marty asks, why do you think McCarthy made such a huge blunder by taking on the army? So before I answer that, I wanna say, you said on your Oppenheimer biography, I wanna say on your brilliant Oppenheimer biography, <laughs> which was helpful to me on the McCarthy book and was something I relished long before that. Um, so to go to the question, I think that he, started to drink the Kool-Aid. He believed that there was nobody who he couldn't take on and triumph over. Um, so there were two reasons. One is this sense that that he was um, he was the kind of guy who would walk by a wet paint sign, Joe McCarthy, and not be able to not be able to resist touching it. The army was the biggest and most powerful of all of the institutions in America and taking them on had a certain charm to this guy who thought he was invincible. But the other reason he took on the army was because he was upset that after initially caving to him when he asked for all these special favors for Roy Cohn's young pal, David Shine, a recent army recruit, the army started saying no to him. and. At that time, he had already taken on the army in terms of charges of them harboring communist moles. But at that time, he really got angry and started taking the army on with twice the venom. And I think that it was some combination, as always with Joe McCarthy, of the personal and the political. And it was, again, by that point in his career, he was drinking enough and he had accepted his own sense of being this towering figure, that it was irresistible to go after an institution like the Army. So another question, um, this is from Bill Hartung. Uh, is it possible to compare the supporters of McCarthy and the supporters of Trump? Do they reach to the same political constituency? I, I, I guess I'm thinking out loud, but you know, young, white, uh, non-college educated voters were, is that the same constituency that both of these 
politicians are appealing to, or yeah. is it something different? So partly I would go back to the quote that I read from Donald Trump and from George Gallup saying that both of them had true believing supporters, that it almost at a certain point didn't matter what their hero was saying, be that hero, Joe McCarthy or Donald Trump, that these were people who saw them as a champion for a little guy, for a for a downtrodden. Um, McCarthy and Trump had all their favorite scapegoats, be it communists or be it rapacious immigrants or traitorous Democrats. But in the end, what they both were more than anything were anti-elitist and a certain version of populist. And I think that there are people who rightfully feel that they've been left behind in an economic recovery in America today or back then, who have a lot of resentments against what they think are the powers that are doing this to them. And Donald Trump and Joe McCarthy share the willingness to shamelessly exploit those senses of fear and insecurity. The fear is real of dislocation. The fear was real back in the 1950s of being afraid of the Soviet Union. The question was, did either Trump or McCarthy offer a solution to those fears? And I would, and I would suggest they offered a scapegoat and not a solution. Well, also though, that suggests that part of the responsibility for the arise of these demagogues is that politicians aren't answering the, the needs of this constituency. Um, you know, yes. the, the Democratic Party didn't have answers. So that is absolutely the vacuum in terms of credible answers is part of the reason that demagogues rise. They're enablers, and we talked about Dwight Eisenhower's enabler. Joe McCarthy was enabled by his fellow senators, not just the Republicans, including a majority leader who was telling his friends, this was Robert Taft, who was telling his friends that Joe McCarthy was a bully and standing up in front of the microphone saying that Joe McCarthy was a great guy. It was Democrats in the Senate who had watched their fellow Democratic Senator um, Millard Tidings of Maryland be taken down by Joe McCarthy when he stood up to McCarthy. So the Democrats said, it's up to you Republicans to take him down. The Republicans said, we're not going to give up our majority and this golden issue by taking him down. It was, we see from the files that have become available, that it was the Texas oil tycoons who bankrolled him that enabled him. But Joe McCarthy's ultimate enablers, like Donald Trump, are us. It's the American people who let these guys rise to power and who support them and who I hope in the end, the way they had done with the other demagogues, that ultimately see through them and bring them down as well. So following on with that, uh, another viewer asked, who were his closest allies in the Senate? And did they later regret the alliances they made with him? So his closest allies um, were a lot of very conservative senators from New England, from the Midwest, from Texas, where they called Joe McCarthy the third senator from Texas. Um, I never met one of McCarthy's enablers in terms of anything that I read about them or that they wrote afterwards, that they didn't all in some way try to cut bait with them and suggest they really hadn't been that close. I would argue that the only reason we know, other than the fact that she was the only woman in the Senate, the only reason 70 years later that we recognize the name Margaret Chase Smith was because the only truly noble thing she did in her long career in the Congress and in the Senate was take on Joe McCarthy. And I would suggest, and I've suggested in 43 separate op-eds in newspapers around the country, that it is a lesson that Republicans in the Senate today should learn from what happened in the wake of Joe McCarthy. So Larry, uh, here's another question from, uh, again, Marty Sherwin. How critical was Roy Cohen to McCarthy? Could McCarthy have managed to do what he did without Roy Cohn? So I think Roy Cohn was really critical, but not irreplaceable. Most of the really vicious things that Joe McCarthy did 
um, were penned by Roy Cohn. It was Roy Cohn's investigation that gave McCarthy the supposed evidence to take on uh, some of the people that he did. But I think if it hadn't been Roy Cohn, he would have found somebody else. And the really intriguing question to me is, the guy who was number two on that staff who might have gotten the job, if it hadn't gone to Roy Cohn or if Roy Cohn left, was this young, bright staffer from Massachusetts named Bobby Kennedy. And so the question is, would Joe McCarthy have been the Joe McCarthy that we knew if Bobby Kennedy had been the guy whispering in his ear instead of Roy Cohn? And the answer is, it's not an obvious no. It is, we're not sure. Wow. Um. What do you think, Victor? You knew Bobby Kennedy as well as I did. I don't think he would have been, although I think Bobby blamed Roy Cohn for a lot more than you do. So <laughs> he did. So Bobby Kennedy, the, the smartest thing Bobby Kennedy ever said about Joe McCarthy was that Roy Cohn, he said, took Joe McCarthy up a steep mountain in a toboggan and they went down with no brakes. And they had a great time and did a lot of whipping and yelling on the way down. But in the end, it was inevitable that they would crash. And I think that was true. The only problem was that Bobby said that it was Roy Cohn who was responsible. And I think it was Joe McCarthy who took Roy Cohn down on the toboggan, not the other way around. Right. Wow. So that asks, prompts me to ask, uh, you know, there's only one biography of Roy Cohn out there, right? So there are um, Roy Cohn's biography by um, the, why am I blanking on the columnist from New York? Um, oh, by Zion. No, Zion was the one, Zion wrote the biography, um, the memoir with Roy Cohn. Oh, that was a right. joint project. And then there was... And oh, I'm Nicholas Van Hoffman. Nicholas Van Hoffman. And, the, and he wrote a very good biography on Roy Cohn. But there have been two recent documentaries on Roy Cohn. And my guess is that as we're speaking, the same way you're in process with a brilliant biography on Jimmy Carter, I suspect that somebody is out there ready to come out with a biography on Roy Cohn soon. And they should have come out with it while Donald Trump was still in the White House. <laughs> the, uh, oh, so, Larry, it's not going to be you, huh? Uh, it's not going to be me. No. Victor, <laughs> is it? Um, okay, so let's see. Here's another question um, from an uh, anonymous viewer. Did you and McCarthy's adopted daughter have any direct conversation? If so, what kinds of things did she have to say? How does she seem to feel about McCarthy? So I'm finally going to be concise in an answer, and the answer is no. Um, much as I wanted to talk to her, um, she doesn't like the public limelight. She has never talked to a reporter, as far as I know, in her 62 years. And she had done me such a favor by opening up the papers. She was an infant when Joe McCarthy died, and the um, she would have had nothing to tell me other than what it was like to be to go through life as Joe McCarthy's daughter, but I figured I had hounded her enough and she was so good to me that I was going to leave her the ice cream and leave her um, her privacy. So here's an, another, maybe a final question, unless Victor's got something to ask uh, again, but why have there not been more McCarthy-like figures in American politics? Um, so... I want to turn that question around and say, why have there been so many McCarthy-like figures? There's been lots of them. <laughs> right. They just haven't risen to the heights. At the beginning of 1954, when the Army McCarthy hearing started, George Gallup told us that Joe McCarthy's popularity was a full 50%. One in every two Americans thought he was doing a swell job, which put him as the number two public figure in America, trailing only Dwight Eisenhower. Thank God... There have been no people like that since then who have risen quite to those heights. But we could go on between the three of us and name two dozen people who qualify as demagogues since Joe McCarthy. And that to me is two dozen too many. Okay, so this has been a lot of fun. Victor, do you have the last no. question? 
No, but I've learned a lot from listening to you too. So, right. Well, on that note, I think we'll uh, we're, we've come to our, the end of our hour, exactly seven o'clock. I just want to remind everyone that uh, our next event is featuring Heather Clark about Sylvia Plath in conversation with Ruth Franklin on October 21st at 6 p.m. And uh, I want to thank Larry for a great conversation and a terrific book. Go out and find it in your independent local bookstore or online, as they say these days. Uh, this has been a lot of fun, and I, too, have learned a lot uh, from this book from, from Larry. And I, I do, uh, actually, I do have one final question. What are you going to, what's your next project? So before I answer that question, I want to say that um, I've done about 150 talks since the book came out, and I've had um, lots of people act as my interlocutors, and none are as smart and as gracious as the two tonight. So I want to thank both of you, Kai and Victor. And my next book is titled The Jasmine, J-A-Z-Z-M-E-N, How Duke Ellington, Satchmo Armstrong, and Count Basie transformed America, and it is my reward to myself and my publisher's reward to me for spending three years with Joe McCarthy. I get to spend the next three years with these three wonderful jazz maestros. Wow, fabulous. I didn't I didn't know there was an answer to that question. <laughs> a fun Thank you. A good answer. All right. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, everyone who's with us virtually. And on that note, we're going to close this down. Thank you. Good night. Good night.